Seems we are here. Hi, Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thanks good for morning. taking your time. Absolutely. Good. Um, so welcome everybody. This was supposed to be the last webinar from the community of practice uh, of crop modeling from the big data platform, the CGIR. But due to unforeseen um, changes, it became the first one of 2022. We're very happy today to have distinguished speaker, Dr. Jonas Jägermeier from a number of institutions. Uh, let me introduce him properly before we start. Um, so Jonas Jägermeier has a, he is a geographer by trade uh, from the Humboldt University in Berlin in Germany in the NASA Ames Research Center. And then he got a PhD from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research, PIC, and the Humboldt University of Berlin again. Um, at the moment, he's working in several positions at the same time. Um, so he's at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, at the Earth Institute of the Columbia University, where he's based, I think. And then also he's a researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And he works on food systems and global food security. And uh, in ACMIP, which is an important uh, modeling effort, he co-leads the accurate and the global gridded crop model in the comparison project. And he's also the coordinator of the agriculture sector of the intersectoral impact model intercomparison project. And um, probably many of you saw his latest paper in Nature Food, which came out late 2021. And after reading that, I realized that I had been in contact with the, uh, the lead author, very interesting work, very drastic results, which we will hear about, especially for maize. And then to my big surprise, Jonas announced that he was going to visit us at Simit during the holidays in Mexico. So we had some good talks about collaboration and, um, after that, I asked him if he could give a seminar for this community and because within Simit and I think outside also, there's a lot of interest in this work, especially for us, obviously, because it's about our two main crops, but um, uh, so we're very happy and please go ahead. It's about 40, 45 minutes. And then I think there will be quite a few questions. Please go ahead, Jonas. Thanks, Kai, wonderful. Thanks for this uh, kind introduction and I'm, uh, Happy to hear, be here, it's an honor um, to present these results. Um, I'll give a little bit of a tour, um, what we do as a group, and then go into detail with the results of that um, very paper. Um, but yeah, let's jump in. So um, I think I'm planning to speak for about 40 minutes, right, if that's okay, and then see where we go in terms of, um, Questions. Um, so titled potential, potential climate related impacts on future maize and wheat yields. Um, that's just suggested, but the work we're doing is a little bit broader. And as you see, there's um, a wide body of uh, co-authors um, because this is certainly a group effort. And AGMA, as you will see in a little bit, is, is, is a large effort with a ton of people in it. So certainly a group effort. Um, the, the paper we're um, presenting here really is the, the first publication of, a, um, uh, of an archive of um, crop model projections, um, process-based um, multi-model ensemble projections out into the future by the end of the century. Um, and this is as of yet um, the largest of ensemble of these, these kind of uh, projections that will lead to many more publications. And here, this is just the first um, highlight with, um, you know, um, focusing on the main messages, but this is a rich data set that, that we'll see a lot of attention, ho hopefully. And here, um, just as a teaser to um, take this off, um, it's an animation made by the NASA news team, um, uh, highlighting these results in a neat way. But before we really go into these results and details, let me go step one step back. And um, for those of you who don't know AGMIP, um, I believe many of you will know, AGMIP is really a large initiative and effort, including um, more than a thousand 
researchers across the board, multinational, across scales and disciplines, really combining the community of ag and ag modeling, uh, ag impacts and adaptation. Um, and we're now happy to announce Agma to just turn 10 double digit. So here we see a group photo from a global workshop in 2016 in Montpellier. It's an ongoing effort. The last two years have been more remote and we um, didn't really have a great birthday party yet, but um, we will hopefully follow up with that. Um, and AgMAP has a ton of initiatives, right? We have all these different pillars and, and, and teams um, from global econ uh, assessments to, to regional integrated assessments to specific crop modeling teams focusing on a specific crop. And within that wealth of, of uh, uh, efforts, we're uh, Christoph Miller and I, um, Christoph at the Potsdam Institute in, um, in Germany and, and I here, Columbia and NASA, we lead the, the AgGrid initiative uh, and the GGCMI, the Global Gridded Modeling, Crop Modeling uh, Initiative, which will then um, lead, uh, um, uh, let me move away this. Zoom videos, I can't see my cursor. Anyway, um, so the Ag Grid, grid and GGCMI um, 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 makes the agricultural sector in ECMIP. And ECMIP is a cross sectoral model uh, into comparison um, that combines various different sectors from um, biomes, water, uh, energy. Uh, health, you name it. So all of these sectors are being provided with the uh, same harmonized input data that we are using in, in GGCMI as well. So there's a uh, mutual collaboration between AgMIB and ECMIB and Sam Rabin and I uh, coordinate the agricultural sector in ECMIB as well. All right, um, so just um, briefly, uh, we have different output types and users out of GGCMI. You know, we're um, creating a harmonized multimodal ensemble that will then be used um, mainly uh, as of yet as uh, in impact assessments, studying adaptation potential, climate change attribution studies. So that's our kind of like uh, uh, bread and butter. Uh, but then traditional, we will also uh, feed into uh, uh, the ACK econ community. So crop yield uh, projections are being used in integrated assessment models and other econ models. And then kind of a new effort that we're trying to build up the seasonal forecasting, eventually leading to early warning systems. So that, that's something we're actively working on. Um, as a quick overview, what we have done as a, um, in the GGCMI and ECMIP community so far, it all started off in 2014 with the, we called it fast track uh, based on CMIP5 uh, global projections. Um, first of its kind combining different crop models in a harmonized way. Um, and really that was the first time we learned that impact models or crop models more spe specifically um, introduce a larger uncertainty than the climate models. So that was the, the, the biggest take home message here that we have a lot of homework to do. Um, and then later in, in the, the first real GGCMI uh, phase, we call it phase one based on reanalysis data, we evaluated a ton of historical reanalysis weather products uh, focused on model improvement and evaluation uh, in 2017, following with phase two which is a, um, a multi-dimensional response surface, if you will. We created a, a huge archive of systematic perturbations of, uh, of uh, input variables. So CO2 would vary across several levels. Temperature would uh, be perturbed from minus one to plus six. Precipitation would be systematically perturbed. Nitrogen application 
uh, and even the growing season uh, would change according to these uh, uh, environmental factors. So we are creating this multi-dimensional lookup table, if you will, that then allows us to create uh, statistical emulators that are lightweight and fast and very versatile. And um, this is this is an effort that uh, allows us to run, you know, hundreds and thousands of simulations just uh, by the click of a button, and uh, uh, has um, a, a wide range of applications that we're still um, working with. And then eventually, now we're in in phase three, um, which are the CMAP six based. Uh, uh, climate uh, model projections um, paired with a new reanalysis product for model evaluation. Um, we have a wider range of years. We're starting in 1850 throughout 2100. And um, as we will see, the first paper out of this effort is um, what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, just real quick, as, a, as an example, what we can do with the, the emulator based work. Um, AgMIP's Impact Explorer uh, creates this response surface. Um, this is actually online live, but I'm um, not sure where my screen would go if, if I click on it. So I think a static version is fine for now, but you can see we, um, we can change these sliders, uh, temperature, precipitation, CO2, pick different nitrogen application levels, pick a different crop and all that. So this is really, you know, user-oriented, uh, 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 stakeholder-oriented um, um, ex data exploration, and it's visual communication. So that's that can be used for people to dive in and actually get a feeling for what climate change can do to global crop yields. Um, one other example I wanna bring up real quick um, that wasn't really listed in, in the main uh, phases and streams of GGCMI and ECMIP. Um, we recently evaluated um, a different scenario, a, a global cooling scenario um, invited by the Open Philanthropy Project, teaming up with climate scientists, evaluating what a regional nuclear conflict could do as indirect effects for global food security. And we simulated a scenario between India and Pakistan, a limited regional nuclear war and uh, soot emissions into the atmosphere that would distribute globally and uh, dim sunlight. And uh, for a limited scenario where we assume a five teragram emission of, of soot, which is a conservative estimate, according to the experts on our team, it has dramatic implications for uh, the, the following 15 years in terms of uh, uh, climate variables. Temperature would uh, uh, drop for uh, uh, 1.8 degrees averaged over the first five years post-conflict. Um, precipitation and radiation would also change. Um, and that has dramatic implications for uh, uh, global crop productivity as shown here as an ensemble of different crop models uh, and uh, different climate model simulations over the course of 15 years with a uh, drastic hit in year two or three and then a gradual uh, um, uh, coming back to normal. So that's an example um, what we can do with this kind of operational framework of uh, crop model uh, ensembles. Here put in a different light, the same figure, but break broke down for, for uh, different regions. And you see the, the higher latitude regions, the US, Europe, and Russia, even 48% decline. Dramatic impacts, we see a regional gradient, right? And that's to, ex to be expected because a cooling will hit higher latitude region, uh, regions in the first place and can actually be somewhat beneficial for some uh, lower latitude uh, regions. And these kind of experiments allow us to understand crop responses more generally. So we can now create a temperature response surface, in this case for maize, um, for a gradual decline in temperature and increasing temperatures. And now these are two different studies. It's a 
it's a different model on ensemble. It's, you know, so they are not necessarily directly comparable, but this kind of um, uh, analysis allows us to, to, or it's an indicator that cooling is actually um, uh, uh, um, hits the crops harder than global warming. Um, and there are several factors to that. Um, the, the warming in this case is a pure temperature perturbation. So it doesn't change any other uh, climate variable and it does not include CO2, which would come on top. Um, but global cooling is particularly harmful for global productivity because major breadbasket regions tend to be located at higher latitudes um, where cooling just hits harder. All right, so with all of that background and you know context of, of what we do, um, I wanna dive into the phase three simulations now a little bit more um, and, and highlight some, some of the main findings. Um, the protocol we're developing, uh, we developed and applied here, um, is based on uh, five CMA6 GCMs. And as, uh, as mentioned, they're um, distributed through eCMIP, who um, bias adjust and downscale the GCM. So they have a new um, quantile based uh, bias adjustment method that um, supposedly. Uh, improves the representation of extreme winds and uh, everything is downscaled to half degree grit. So our default resolution in, in global simulations is half degree. We run different uh, RCPs. The new notion for CMIP6 is, is the SSP RCP combination. So SSP1 combined with RCP2.6 makes SSP126. Um, but the SSP component and this uh, um, uh, set of simulations is kept constant. So we're only changing the climate. So I'm just gonna speak of RCP 2.6, RCP 7, and RCP uh, 8.5. Um, the crop modeling contributions are an ongoing process. We are currently having 12 uh, GGCMs, global gridded crop models. Um, still counting. So there are additional teams still running these simulations and they will participate in upcoming publications. So as of now, we roughly have 240 simulations per crop. Um, and the core of GGCMI is that we are having a harmonized protocol that we're trying to, to um, have everybody use the same inputs and uh, try to align assumptions and parameters where, where possible. And we are actively trying to in, improve our input data. So we have new fertilizer application rates um, and we developed a new crop calendar, planting and harvest dates based on observational data to improve these simulations. And I will come back to that because that's also an ongoing effort. And I will ask for your contribution for just that in the very end of the presentation. Um, now as a new standard in, in, in our work, we apply a, a yield bias correction. You know, the, the crop models all simulate very different yield levels and you can't really average about, across a model that says 15 tons per hectare and the other says five tons per hectare in that, in that very great cell. So we are using an observational yield map and then multiply it with simulated fractional yields to, um, to be fair to the models. And of course, it's it's a process based approach. So um, we do have mechanistic representations of all these processes, including the CO two effect, which is one of the uh, most sensitive effects and introduces a large amount of uncertainty. At the bottom, you see the different climate models and crop models. Um, more than welcome to talk about these individually, but that's uh, at the level of detail that I can't do here. Um, real quick, we have two major simulation rounds. One is what I said, the isolated climate signal. We keep everything management and, and adaptation constant at the year 2015 level. And we only let the climate vary. So we have a PI control run, a pre-industrial pre control run. Um, and then we have a historical simulation and then the future scenarios. And then in, 
a next simulation phase that that is actually upcoming, and we will get to this in uh, in the in, uh, in spring this year. Um, we will look at management and adaptation more specifically. So the idea is to use SSP specific um, adaptation uh, and management inputs, uh, such as uh, changing the growing season and cultivars, changing fertilizer inputs and land use um, to have a more holistic picture of uh, um, crop productivity by the end of the century. Now let's look at uh, the highlights of this uh, first paper. Um, I would like to um, just mention the, the three main themes. Um, so the, the, the first major finding is the crop responses to climate change are more pronounced than expected or than seen in previous simulations. And by more pronounced, I mean more negative, more pessimistic for some crops, but also more positive, more optimistic for wheat. Um, and one second before we get to that, uh, we here see the, the, the mean response for the RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 in green and yellow. And then we see the dashed vertical line, which is the range of climate model responses averaged across crop models with the individual data points. And then the, the solid line is the range of crop models averaged across climate models. So for the um, high mitigation scenario, RCP 2.6, the range or say uncertainty associated with climate models and crop models is roughly similar. But when moving to a higher emission scenario, the range of crop models is inflated and dominates the signal. Right, and that's associated to the CO2. Uh, not only temperature is also plays a role, but that's an important find. Um, the important point I wanna make here on this slide, however, is the difference of the new crop model ensemble, GGCMI CMIP6, or then GC6, compared to our reference work uh, uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig's paper in 2014, um, highly cited and, and considered one of the, the reference work. Uh, on average, that whole ensemble for maize, end of century, RCP 8.5, resulted in plus 1% global uh, uh, maize productivity. Now the new ensemble, new climate data, new crop models, new inputs, suggest minus 24%. So that's a substantial shift compared to previous estimates. And we will look into that a little bit, why that is. Now for wheat, um, as mentioned, we see an uptick. The new ensemble is more sensitive and shows more optimistic results. And then for soybean and rice, the overall uncertainty is large and the mean response uh, minus two um, plus 1.7 isn't really that significant. Um, and we should be careful interpreting these results in view of the large uncertainty. Um, but a consistent result is that the new ensemble is uh, more pessimistic than previously thought. And if you look at the uncertainty range here in the old simulations, um, some models even went up to plus 80% for rise, mainly attributed to, to CO2. So that's a consistent pattern, more pessimistic for maize, soybean and rice and more optimistic for wheat. The second main finding is um, the time of climate impact emergence, which is um, a new metric that has been used in the climate sciences, but not really in the agricultural impact science. So we are introducing that concept and show that the time of climate impact emergence occurs now much earlier than previously thought. The time of emergence is um, a risk metric. It compares the mean signal with the historical variability and uncertainty that we call noise. And once the, the mean signal leaves that envelope, um, 
we call that the time of emergence or TCIE, time of climate impact emergence. And now for the new CMIP6 based simulations, the year of time climate impact emergence occurs much earlier than compared with the old simulations. In that case, uh, the, the ensemble mean wouldn't even indicate any emergence by the end of the century. And now we're, we're seeing years uh, not that far out into the future for global maize productivity under RCP 8.5 uh, within 10 years and for weed um, within the next couple of years. Wheat, however, shows a positive change. So we calculate the time of emergence for positive change. Um, but uh, the, the response is, is seen to level off by mid-century and then some uh, models actually show, show a decline by the end of the century. Um, this is another figure highlighting, highlighting the distribution of um, climate crop model combinations. So showing the, the time of emergence as a distribution across the whole ensemble. Um, in, in red, the CMIP six based, and in blue, the CMIP five based, the, the median response here is in year 2030, and 84% of the ensemble indicate the time of emergence by the end of the, cent the century. For the previous ensemble, only 46% did that, and there's no mean uh, emergence before the end of the century. So a substantial shift towards earlier uh, emergence in the new data. And for wheat, it's, the, it's the, the same pattern, but the old ensemble did see, did indicate for a, a climate impact emergence um, pretty early on. Now that we see that emergence might occur earlier than expected, it is also more widespread than previously thought. This map shows the emergence time um, for each grid cell. And in many regions in Central Asia and even in the US, in the Mediterranean region and many other uh, uh, world uh, breadbasket regions, we do see very early um, emergence time, emergent times. If we calculate the area, cumulative area um, over time, um, by the end of the century under RCP 8.5, 74% of global maize growing areas are indicated to see an emergence signal. And that's substantially more than in the previous ensemble where only 47% indicated that. Um, now, even in, in a high mitigation scenario, um, there are widespread regions that do show early on changes um, that uh, are um, hard to avoid given the the short lead time and um, the already high mitigation effort in these kind of scenarios. Now, um, okay, here's here's another illustration by the NASA News team um, <clears throat> showing um, grid level emergence uh, time. Um, when looking at these uh, gridded data, it's important to realize that the time of emergence will always show earlier dates years at larger uh, aggregations. So if you look at national level or global level, uh, the time of emergence will occur earlier because in an averaged uh, manner, the uncertainty is lower. So at grid cell level, these uh, time uh, estimates will, will show up later. In time. Um, we can integrate that with uh, existing work, uh, for air temperature here out of um, AR5, um, showing similarly early uh, emergent times um, in lower latitudes, especially. And uh, for these three sample regions, you see a little distribution of the, the different, I think it's 38 climate models. Um, so that's consistent with our results that the, the emergence in the, in, the, in the climate system, the the um, in temperature and then precipitation is already happening in um, many parts of the world. Here's a, a CMIP five based precipitation estimate for um, time of emergence. All right. Um, 
yeah, let's switch gears a little bit. The, um, the third main finding, and by the way, I don't see the chat, so, okay. Um, yeah, let's go back to the questions in the end and then maybe somebody can uh, summarize that, what's happening in the chat. So the third main finding is the regional distribution of impacts. And that's not a new finding, uh, that's consistent with previous work, but it is important um, for the implications. So this is a latitudinal profile across theoretical uh, yield responses. So we are simulating the crop yield responses in all terrestrial grid cells, irrespective of the current distribution of cropland. And then in gray, we have the actual distribution. So where these two overlap, we do have real world implications. Um, outside of that, it's theoretical, right? Um, and for all crops, we see the same pattern. Impacts are largest at lower latitudes and higher latitudes might see potential gains from moderate additional warming. Um, and that explains the, the wheat response where, you know, um, a lot of the wheat is grown at higher latitudes, uh, uh, whereas maize is, is, is often cultivated at, at, uh, across wider ranges of, of lower latitudes, which adds to the um, overall more negative maize response. Um, that very point is in IPCC language, a reason for concern because at uh, lower latitudes, as you all know, maize is often uh, a food crop uh, used in a self-sufficient environment. Whereas at high latitudes, maize is usually <clears throat> a feed crop and used for biofuels. Um, so the, the disproportional response across latitudes to climate change uh, um, will directly impact uh, livelihoods and, and, and food security. Okay, um, <clears throat> now you will ask the question, okay, why is that? Why is the CMIP6 based crop model ensemble so much different and so much more pessimistic? And here are three um, reasons we can do this in a comprehensive way because we can't just rerun older sets of climate simulations with the new crop model ensemble. It's a huge computational effort. So we can only do diagnostics, but we can't do a holistic um, um, re redo this whole set. Okay, first point is um, CMIP6 is much warmer than CMIP5. Um, here we see for the two RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 across the total global uh, land area by about 0.3 degrees Celsius. RCP 2.6 uh, is actually warmer. The difference is higher than, than for RCP 8.5. The interesting point is that over, um, um, over highly productive breadbasket regions, those grid cells that make for 50% of the global maize productivity, sorry, global maize production, the temperature difference between CMIP6 and CMIP5 is even higher. It's more than half degree uh, Celsius. And again, in RCP 2.6, more than in RCP 8.5. And that's huge. So CMIP6 has higher warming levels, which are associated with um, higher uh, climate sensitivities, um, which are being debated. Um, uh, and that's a different discussion, but it has significant impacts for crops, obviously. The second point is um, the crop model ensemble has advanced. We have additional models. All models have changed and are improved. Um, input data are improved which results in a higher warming sensitivity. In blue, we have the CMIP5 based ensemble in red, the CMIP6 based ensemble. And for a generic change from one to two degrees Celsius in each grid cell, we see a substantially higher yield response 
um, without the CO2 effect, just the warming sensitivity from two to three degrees Celsius, the same story. And then the net amount given the higher warming in the new CMIP-6 simulations and the higher warming sensitivity leads to three times as much yield declines than in uh, under a 4.6 degrees warming in, in, in the CMIPS 5 based simulations compared to a five degree warming under uh, CMIPS 6 um, based simulations. And finally, the third point I wanna make is the CO2 sensitivity. Um, at least for maize, the CO2 sensitive sensitivity in the new simulations is reduced, which is a good thing um, as we see these uh, being more realistic now, um, largely in line with um, field observations, phase experiment observations, uh, but still introducing one of the, being one of the largest sources of uncertainty. Um, so the, um, the CO2 response at 500 ppm and at 700 ppm is lower. Um, and the net CO2 response, even though CO2 concentration is assumed higher in CMIP6, substantially higher in RCP 8.5, the net CO2 response is lower, which adds to more pessimistic maze responses. Um, then you can ask, okay, we have these two ensembles, which one should we trust? Is there, is any better than the other? And that's a very legit question. Um, I said there's discussions with uh, regard to the climate sensitivity and CMIP6 isn't necessarily seen as a replacement for CMIP5. Um, we rather see it as a complement and it's important to evaluate both and learn from it. When it comes to the crop model ensemble, we tend to say that the new ensemble is structurally better. The models have improved, the inputs have improved, and we see that in this figure. Um, here we show um, the variance introduced by the crop models, GGCMs, and introduced induced by the climate models, GCMs, in yellow. And in GC5, the uh, CMIP5 based simulations, virtually all uncertainty or variance was induced by the crop models, 97%, and only 3% is from the climate models. That's ridiculous. So in the new set of simulations, the crop model uncertainty still dominates at 69%, but we are getting towards a more balanced picture. Um, which is important. And that's consistent for the other crops. Um, the, the climate model uncertainty is increased and the crop model uncertainty is decreased also in terms of an absolute variance. Okay, the other thing is um, we can't really compare GCM simulations with historical observations. The timing isn't right, but we can look at the, the simulated variability and uh, the the interannual fluctuation, the standard deviation in, in simulated yields and observed FAO yields is hit much better, it's met much better in the new crop model ensemble with a lower um, mean square and a, a much higher um, uh, R value than compared to the CMIP5 simulations. Um, as said, um, we developed a new um, crop calendar um, for this work. Um, you're shown planting maturity dates for maize, winter wheat, and spring wheat, combining various data sources um, with a, based on a specific metric, combining known data sets. You might know some of these, uh, combining these into a composite product, uh, hoping we're, we're doing better than before. Um, this data set is, is freely available and um, please reach out if you wanna use it. But I bring it up particularly because we wanna expand on this work and on my last couple of slides, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, this whole simulation archive is public and we as GGCMI and maybe AGMET more generally don't have the capacity 
to write all these amazing papers. So we explicitly invite uh, uh, external teams to come in and use these data for their work. Um, you know, we have a few of our internal papers and then we have a long list already, which is uh, hopefully growing in the future of external partners uh, collaborating with us using the data and write um, wonderful, exciting research papers. Um, I wanna end this part of the presentation with a, a quick conclusion page. Um, we see in the new data that the climate change response for crops is much more pronounced due to warmer climate models, better and more sensitive crop models and higher CO2 levels, which means higher gains for wheat and more pessimistic responses for other crops. Um, we, we introduced the, the, the climate impact emergence metric and show that the, uh, the emergence is actually around the corner. Uh, and is a new risk metric um, that is um, important to look at. And uh, we see that there's going to be dramatic changes in basically all breadbasket regions. If the change will be positive or negative, um, um, most of the currently cultivated areas will be affected. Um, and then the geographical distribution um, is unfortunate and will disproportionately affect the poor. Um, that usually have small adaptation capacity. So that's that's the problem at this whole point. Um, and then again, just highlighting that the, the, the data is public and we encourage people to, to come work with the data or collaborate with us. If you wanna have more details, uh, it's obviously online, so go check it out. Um, okay, 11.42. So I wanna end this with um, a quick outlook What's, what's coming next and what we're working on and what we're excited about. Um, so let's go through this really quickly. Um, I just wanna say that um, despite the different yield responses, maize shown big declines, weed shows increases, we consistently see that the future yield variability is increasing. Um, so even for weed, the, here we call it CV, the coefficient of variation, um, uh, standard deviation divided by the mean goes up and that can cause problems even though mean changes increase. So here's a map of changes in yield CV. Um, you know, you basically in all major maize growing regions, you see a decline, uh, sorry, a substantial increase in yield variability. Um, and that can be related to heat waves and droughts. We see that the number of these are significantly increasing, plotted in a different way um, in, in box plots, sorry, which is important for, for attribution. Um, we can say these are increasing due to climate change based on such a figure. Um, and then we wanna understand um, what are the impacts of each or what are the impacts of these events in general? And here's some, some work showing uh, historically the impacts associated with extreme weather disasters taken from the EMDA database has already in increased. And Corey Lesk and colleagues in a prominent paper showed that it doubled over the last 50 years. My PhD student uh, showed it for Europe that impacts tripled in associated with droughts and heat waves. So the question is, how would that turn out in the future? We're trying to develop these kind of composite figures for heat waves and droughts. And that's really preliminary work. So don't cite me on these numbers. This is really more like a conceptual figure that it's not just important to look at mean changes, but for the farmers and insurance and you know everybody, it's, it's important to, um, um, to understand what is the fluctuation, the year-to-year -year variability and the, the net impacts of these events. And then finally, in my last slide, kind of I wanna highlight that we were trying to develop, develop um, a better crop calendar. And that's, that's a huge ongoing effort and, and many people have contributed data. We're seeing significant trends in planting and harvest if we can look at annual 
planting and harvest data, not just the average state. So we're trying to scrape data from all sorts of um, ACT ministries, um, phenological databases, um, and, and, and experimental sites. We have a bunch of data from CIMIT already. Um, here's the phenological database in, in, in Europe, um, all showing significant trends. So we're trying to create a composite product with annual planting and harvest dates or maturity dates that can inform crop models, but that can also inform um, and, uh, deriving empirical trends. So this is really ongoing work. And, and um, I just put it out here to, to say that we're highly interested to collaborate. And if you have an idea of additional data sources that could come in here, um, I would be uh, uh, more than happy to, to jump on the call and, and see if we can turn this into a collaboration. With that, I would like to thank for all your attention. I spoke a lot now and I'm excited to see if you have questions. Please get in, in touch, um, email, uh, and then more info on acmip.org. Um, it's an ongoing collaborative effort, so please get in touch. And over to you, Kai, I guess. Yeah, thanks a lot. Very relevant for our work, obviously, and quite drastic. Um, let's see what we have in terms of, of questions. I think Matthew has had a look. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. Um, and by the way, thank you, Jonas. Great job and very clear. Um, so here's a question from Yangui Kang, who says, how were the impacts of land use slash cover change considered in the projections? Right, yeah. Um... So the, this first set of simulations, we we're really trying to isolate the climate signal. So everything land use and management in general, sorry for the background noise, is kept constant. So we are not considering any changes in land use or land cover change. We are using a 2015 map and apply that throughout the future to really say this is the climate signal. And then in our upcoming simulation effort, we're really carefully looking at these changes in land use, fertilizer application, planting dates, cultivars, and all that to try to, to have a look at in a packaged way, in an SSP specific way, what management can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Mary Abbas asking, is thanking you for your excellent presentation and saying, um, could we also model other important traits such as wheat quality using the right. projections? <clears throat> yeah, that's um, that's obviously a big point. Um, you know, crop models indicate substantial increases in wheat yield or productivity associated with the uh, higher atmospheric know. carbon dioxide. But what we don't talk about is that despite increased yield, um, the micronutrient content, the, the quality of the crop might actually decrease. The plant is growing faster and bigger, but it doesn't necessarily uh, allocate uh, larger amounts of uh, uh, protein and micronutrients. So, you know, there's a wealth of research on these topics and quite honestly, it's a little bit outside of our comfort zone to speak to that. Um, but we are trying to expand and we're trying to use our models as on a proxy basis. The, the global scale crop models aren't really in shape yet to, to do that, but we can use a carbon to nitrogen uh, 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 ratio as a proxy for protein. And that's something we will get to at some point. We did some preliminary work. We haven't included it here, um, but it's obviously a, a, a big question and, and others are probably in a better position to, to speak to that, but it's, it's, it's on our list and it's clear that it is important. Thank you. Um, here's a question, anonymous. Genetic gain and technology are still making crop yields increase. How's genetic gain considered in future projections? Right. Yeah, same same answer. Um, it's it's kept constant. 
recalibrate our models at the year 2015 level. Um, and each team is doing that in their individual way. Um, and then we assume that to be constant to isolate the climate signal um, in upcoming efforts, we will consider cultivar changes um, to some extent. It's, it's a tricky topic, um, but we will focus on it. Okay, good. Um, how about, here's one from Jianyong Ma. How about multi-cropping systems in the tropics? Right. I assume yeah. the emphasis there, the, the implication there is that the possibility of systems being more stable as a result of diversity. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't, yeah, not sure about the stable. Um, so yeah, multi-cropping is a, is, a, is a big topic too. Um, traditionally, we would only simulate a single cropping, uh, a single season per year in each grid cell for, for each crop. Um, and that's because we just don't have the data. We don't have a consistent global data set on crop rotations. And we're working on it on a different front, uh, front with Katarina Waha and uh, Cesar and, and Australia and, and others. Um, but uh, we do simulate some rotations in an uh, intrinsic way. So we, we have the, the crop calendar that would define when soy is planted in the S and when, when maize or corn is planted and these go together, right? So we do have somewhat of a rotation, but they're not simulated in the same grid cell. So we don't have the carryover effects for nutrients, for soil, water, and these kind of things in a true multi-cropping sense. Um, in this round of simulations, for the first time, we simulate two rice seasons, which is a good step forward, not just the primary season, but we have consistent data for two seasons now. And that is important also for the exposure to weather and climate, right? So if we don't get the season right, if we assume a crop is, 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 is growing at a very different uh, uh, growing season, then we, we get the, the, the climate uh, response wrong. So that's obviously an important topic. And hopefully in the future, we have more consistent data to really uh, have a, a better representation of the agricultural systems in the tropics. Okay, great. Here's one from Cornelia Awa. Sorry if I am not pronouncing your name correctly. Thanks for the great presentation. I'm currently struggling with one specific model, which is mostly only projecting crop increases due to CO2 fertilization. Would you recommend to always use the median across all AGMIT models in order to get a reliable picture? How would you rate the readiness of AGMIT model models to also cover extreme events? Yeah, very good questions. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a generic answer to that. Um, often we do see that the median or mean response of crop models performs best when compared to historical observations. Say we're using FAO, FAO statistics and uh, try to explain interannual variability, the multi-model mean usually does a pretty good job. And in some cases is actually better than any individual model. So taking a mean amps up your game. So that's pretty cool, um, but it's not always the case. And more importantly, getting historical, historical fluctuations right doesn't mean you get future mean changes right. Right, so um, it, it can be an indicator that the models work, but it's it's a it's a tricky question. Um, after all, all that said, we always trust the multi-model ensemble mean or median better than any individual model. So that's that's the that's the strength of these multi-model assessments that we have an uncertainty estimate. We have we can see where the models cluster and we can increase confidence by using all these different approaches. So that's what I'm gonna to say to, to mean and median. Um, for the extremes, that's a different question and that's actually ongoing work. We just submitted a paper where we look at how 
the multimodal ensemble can explain historical observed heat and drought impacts, again, based on the EMDAT extreme weather disaster database. And some models do pretty okay, but we also see that in general, the models underestimate the impacts. So in that sense, we probably show conservative estimates, especially when we see yield increases, um, we might not have the full uh, representation of uh, the impact of future extreme events represented in our results. So that's ongoing work, and um, but very important. Can I can I ask a quick follow up, follow up question on that? So in recent years, we have seen wildfires on an unprecedented scale, and 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 hurricanes, and presumably there is some data already on the, those impacts on crops. Even uh, har har you know, wind can prevent you from being able to harvest a crop adequately, severe wind, for example. Has there been any attempt to uh, extrapolate from current or historic situations on extreme yeah. events? <clears throat> so when it comes to wildfires and wind, um, that's certainly beyond the granularity and scope of our global modelings at this point. Um, there is work that now looks at the indirect effects of, of uh, uh, wildfire emissions, similar to what I've shown with the nuclear conflict. So the, the so emissions of wildfires can dim sunlight, which has an effect on radiation and crop productivity. Um, but to simulate the the actual extent of a fire and potential damage to crops is not re represented. Um, same with wind, that's that's beyond the scope. We um, just don't have the data or the the, mm -hmm. the model really that that would have any handle on on where wind would damage or indirect uh, effects like preventing plant um, preventing harvest or something like that or hail damage or something. That's that's really beyond the scope of global models. Um, what's more tangible is flooding, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the big missing factors. And traditionally we get blamed for, okay, the models are, and going back to Cornelia's question, models are doing traditionally pretty okay when it comes to heat waves, droughts, moisture stress and heat damage and all these kind of things compared to flood damage, excess moisture which isn't really represented in the models. Some do have the, the processes, but then maybe the soils are percolation is too fast. So the soil wouldn't saturate and really trigger these kind of processes. So our model ensemble response to flooding and excess moisture is really bad. Um, and we have a couple of ongoing um, efforts to, to tackle that um, maybe in post-processing and improve the models itself. But yeah, wind and fire is, certainly beyond what we can do at mm -hmm. this point, at least. What about um, un uh, severe delay of rainfall? Yeah, I mean, that's covered in the climate data, right? Um, so where climate data is at a daily basis. So that's, that's the forcing of the crop models. So they are very sensitive to these kind of things. Um, Couple of points on that. Um, we're currently using a static crop calendar. So planting is assumed at the same day, whatever the conditions are. Um, so that's a problem. You know, we don't have delayed planting, um, which will become a thing in our adaptation scenarios that we will kick off in a little bit. So we have an algorithm that calculates future planting and harvest dates based on a, you know, on a set of uh, precipitation temperature responses. And the other thing is that in some crop models, the crops don't really die necessarily. So you have a very bad season, heavy, heavy drought impact, severe drought, and the crop is suffering. It's not growing further, but it's not necessarily dying. And then at some point you get some precipitation back out in the fall, the, the plant will come up again and grow and is happy and maybe does cover make up for some of the losses. So that's certainly a point that um, we need to address um, better to um, 
so in my understanding that, that the crop failures we're simulating aren't always as realistic as we would wish they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it's 11, but we still have plenty of participants. So let me ask a question from Jiao Gu uh, at IFPRI. When you bring results from multiple crop models, do you apply different weights or treat models all independently? Nice. And is yeah. there a model behaving similarly because of the way they're developed or the choice of model data input? How do you analyze and interpret results from multiple multiple models, statistically speaking? Right. Now that's fantastic. Um, quick answer is no. We're treating all the same way. We don't have a handle on saying this model is better than the other, so it gets a bigger, higher weight. Um, so for now, all contributions are, are independent and equally weighted, um, but it's changing in the field. So in, in the water sector in ECMIP for now, for, for an example, they start doing a, a weighted ensemble mean based on performance, based on, uh, on benchmarking uh, uh, results compared to gauge uh, estimates and you name it. So um, yeah, uh, we are actively thinking about it. Um, the question is how are you in a position to judge a model when it comes to future estimates, right? The CO2 response, temperature response, all of these, like we're not in the position to say this model is better than the other. Um, but when it comes to say extreme event impacts, I showed these composite figures, these V-shaped uh, uh, composite figures where we overlay all the events. We can certainly sort out those models that do well and only pick the ones that you know, do well or give a certain rating or something. And I think it's important. That's, um, that's certainly next step. Um, the question is in the agricultural world in the, in the field of ag modeling, it's very tricky to assign skill level or, or be confident about making a call what model is better than the other. And then okay. just real quick, that, that, you know, we, one other observation is that we don't really find that one model outperforms all the others across regions and crops. We can say, okay, one model is doing pretty okay for corn in the US and then for wheat in Germany but we don't have that one model that's better than all the others. So this is going to be a, a patching. It's, it's going to be a very tricky landscape of performance skills. Yeah. Okay, I'm seeing that uh, a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, Jonas, uh, you may well have another meeting you need to go to or limitation. Um, so um, do you want to do you want to put a time limit or? Or do you need um, to go now? I'm I'm okay. I can stick around for a few minutes. Um, that's fine. It's it's fun fun to talk about this. So um, I'll, I'll okay, leave that up to you if, you if you have to close there. No, we don't. We still have a, a ninety participants, so I think we can we can keep going. Um, I'm going to be a little selective. Some are very very regional specific. I mean, there's a question I've seen. How do people get access to crop models? Anyone want to give a quick answer to that access to the code these D sat whatever yeah oh i see that um yeah um sure uh so in principle not all of them but most of the models have open source code mm -hmm. so you could go ahead and download the model and try your best but um, that's a little tricky endeavor. And usually we think of this as a suitable task for say a PhD student who has a multi-year uh, planning horizon. These models aren't necessarily user-friendly. It's not a desktop application where you just put in a few numbers and click go. DSET does have that. There's a graphical user interface. You download the model on your desktop and you calibrate it for a site. But what we're doing is um, globally gridded setups, right? So we simulate each crop and each grid cell globally. So these models run at supercomputers and tend to be uh, pretty uh, uh, um, complex and uh, computationally expensive. So 
long story short, um, there are models that you can run on your own. Um, but if you're interested in joining these kind of globally uh, set up simulations, I would say get in touch with us. Uh, GGCMI is an open uh, uh, initiative. Um, we have bi-weekly calls where everybody is welcome. We have protocols that we can share. If you have a model that you wanna run based on this protocol, or if you wanna learn a new model and, and just um, participate and work with us, more than welcome, reach out. My email is here on the screen still, if you can still see it. So um, I'm very happy to, to include you in the group. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Eugene Terkel. Are possible changes in cropping regions considered in future projections? And I assume that could include expansion as well as movement. <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, so yeah, again, in these current results, we don't uh, include any changes in cropping regions. Um, uh, everything is kept constant at the 2015 level. In the future simulations, um, we are going to have changes in land use um, that are GDP-based integrated assessment models. We'll run these based on, you know, outlooks for crop yields and so forth. So there's a whole uh, a pathway behind what we will have in these scenarios. That said, it does make a whole lot of sense to have a dedicated study evaluating potential shifts, not just a foreseen or anticipated shift based on economics and all other things. So that could be a wonderful paper to do even based on the simulations we have right now, because we simulate crops in our grid cells and we do land use in post-processing. We just pick the grid cells of interest and apply a weighting, right? So if you wanna come in and write a paper about this, this is amazing and uh, let's do it. You just take the simulations and see if crops will be more productive outside of currently grown regions and optimize the land use patterns. That's a pretty straightforward study that should be done. Here's an interesting question. Um, the point is that the, the longer term in, impacts that can be predicted or we try to predict are definitely of interest to policymakers and long term markets and so on. But the, here the question is for a farmer, they need to know the year-to-year -year variation, right? The granularity at that level, that's what affects them most. And so the question is uh, how sensitive are, I mean, that's a tough one I can see to get a sensitivity to something as unpredictable as the weather, but what's your comment right. on that? No, exactly. Um, and we're kind of like shifting a little bit in that direction, right? 10 years ago, there was mean changes, end of century, long-term outlooks. And we still do that, but in this work, we introduced the emergence metric, which is already a little bit of a shift, looking at it from a risk perspective, comparing mean changes with your historical variation. The 5% change in one grid cell can be very different to a 5% change in an environment where you have to where you have 10% interannual variability anyways, right? So that's a step forward. But then on my outlook slides, I showed that um, this will be the next focus in, in some of our work to really look at the, the variability and um, isolate the, the event impacts based on the surrounding years and not the long-term historical average. So I agree that this is, very important and I expect that the models do okay um you know they're yeah they're they're not perfect but the the we show in that one figure with the the balloons lining up that the the simulated variability variability in the new ensemble is much more realistic than in the previous ensemble so we do have some confidence that the models can get the variability right. And they all consistently show that variability is, is projected to increase. 
So that's um, something we want to look at and agree. It's, it's it's probably more important than mean changes in 80 years out in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I'm not quite sure if I'm getting the right angle on this question, but it seems to be saying, how do your... How do your um, predictions um, work when you actually use historical data? How accurate are they? I would assume right, uh, you use them for calibration in the first place anyway. Right. Sorry, didn't get the question. Yeah, let's skip it because it, it's it's uh, uh, there's a seems to be a good nugget there, but I'm not quite getting the nuance. Okay, here's one. Most big food companies are tracking all elements of of of, of production raw material planting dates, you whether for the sustainability commitments. What would this set of data be useful if anonymized for modeling? So private sector data sets. Uh, so I'm reading my, uh, so, so you're saying most big companies tracking planting dates. So that would be helpful for creating a, a more consistent product for academic purposes. So Isabel, if you're still on and, and, and know where we can find these data, please reach out um, because that that's it. We, we've tried to get into the insurance field and try to tap into that and find insurance data for planting and, and harvest. Um, we're, we're still on the, on the early stage of that, but, um, and anonymized, yeah. I mean, what we're currently doing, everything is open access and we're, you know, we just combine different data sets and, and everybody contributing as a co-author and we publish everything and then everybody can use the data. Um, um, yeah, I don't know, I'm just randomly uh, talking out loud. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it just, you know, it crosses my mind that, that, that this might be something to, to, to get into a little bit, to, to try to tap into, into to the, the competitive space, into companies that would track these kind of data. I don't really know how to start, but um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very helpful. If, if you could help me on that, that that'd be amazing. That would be a, a, a nice angle to pursue. In fact, there's a lot of data there that probably lawyers, like lawyers don't want to be released, but could actually be extremely useful in the public sector. Hmm. Okay, here's one. Um, basically, does your model make any assumptions about insects? Insects like warmer climates? No, no, again, that's, that's beyond the, the granularity any pollination or, or insect community or something is, is, is way beyond what, what our models can do. But yeah, it's, an, it's a very important topic, obviously. Um, but yeah, no. Here's one. Uh, do you include agroforestry models in your studies? Um, well, that's a good question. Not really. Um, so in in GGCMI and, and the set of crop models we're, we're combining, we basically have two different types. We have the pure site-based crop models that are then run in a, in a gridded setup. And then we have these kind of more ecosystem type models that um, are hybrid hydrological crop models that um, simulate natural vegetation, competition in natural vegetation um, river routing and all these kind of things. Um, but that still isn't agroforestry, right? It, so um, it's just a more more comprehensive and more holistic simulation approach. Um, and in some of these, we implemented um, management aspects that would go in the direction of agroforestry. We implemented better water management, water harvesting, mulching, um, uh, and things and, and agroforestry fits right in there. So um, that's not necessarily what we do in a multi-model um, ensemble setup, 
that's more the individual model development for a PhD student or somebody who's really interested in these kind of questions would pick one of these models and, and work on these fronts um, because these more specific questions are then you know, implemented in very different ways, even if there's a couple of models who can do that, um, it's hard to compare. But um, in generally speaking in GGZMI, we have the, the core simulation setup, how we call it, which is what I presented here, climate change, signal, you know, emergence and a, a set of protocol simulations that are required. And then we have site branches. So we encourage people to come in and kick off a site branch. One example is, is ozone, Agma ozone. We are now grouping all of these grid models that can do ozone and we are developing a new protocol and, and group all these models that, that can actually simulate future and historical ozone concentrations and the response for crops. You know, and then we have irrigation and you know, all sorts of different site branches or activities where we can look into these kind of things if somebody has the capacity and interest to um, look into that. So that's a long answer for speaking to agroforestry, but it's just, you know, there's a whole lot of things we can do and it all comes down to, to the capacity and bandwidth we have. So um, it, yeah, so collaboration is key and somebody who wants to work on this, please uh, come forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I, I'm going to ask the last question, and there's somebody has a burning one. Please write it again in the Q and A, not in the chat. Um, as I ask this question and it is being answered, otherwise it will be the last one. Is there a simple way you would recommend to access the bias corrected CMI P6 climate data? Uh, yes, uh, go to easymip.org and download it. That's the simple answer. It's it's all public. It's uh, open access. Uh, ECMIP provides uh, access to a data server where you can download um, the CMIP6 climate data, including most of the input data we're using here. And soon also um, the crop modeling output data. So it's all in one place and publicly available. I can actually, can I chat? Uh, Type it in the chat, easymip.org. Here you go. Great. I'll hand back to Kai now, the MC. Yes. Thanks a lot, Jonas, again, for taking your time and sharing all this very interesting work. We hope we will be able to collaborate more in the future. And expecting more interesting uh, articles to come out of the larger group. We will be following that, hopefully have a chance to, to chat again and do another presentation in the future. And thanks a lot Very to everybody cool. for taking their time. And yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jonas. In. Uh, half the participants are still here, just over. Thank you for uh, good questions and attendance. Yeah, great questions. Thanks for hanging out for so long. <laughs> just just as a just as a uh, um, kind of belated message to the community of practicing crop modeling um, unfortunately we can't it doesn't look like it's going to be funded to continue um, there is however a very good uh, platform as you as you would all know the agmip and we we were working closely to with them so, so the community is not lost. It's just lost one of its uh, one of its venues, I guess. For now, anyway, we'll Kai and I'll be working to see if we can re 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 revitalize it in some other way. And Diego. So, anyway, okay. thank you, guys. Have a good rest thank of you your all. day. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. Thank you. Cheers, Jonas. Bye.